Okay, great. So good evening, everybody. I wanted to thank you, really, really thank you, all right, for being and joining, being able to join with us this evening. I want to welcome you all to an MSVs and News program series that we started to call MSVs Now. It's a virtual event provided by MSVs and News. And tonight we're featuring Mitzi Williams, a actually Mitzi Joy Williams. All right, she's an That's MS correct. neurologist. She's an MS neurologist from Atlanta, Georgia. A little later on, I will, you know, read her bio to you. But for right now, I just want to begin tonight's event, and I want to um, just mention a few things to you. Number one, we would like to thank our sponsors for this series. This series is sponsored by Genentech and Bristol Myers Squibs, and we really want to thank them for working with us and being, you know, being able to help us to provide this series for everybody that is able to come on to this format. And speaking about format, so tonight. Again, we have Dr. Williams. She's going to be discussing MS updates. We have a few updates that she will be discussing with you. After that, she's going to discuss access to your healthcare team during a pandemic. All right. And then last, we're saving for the best for last. All right. Understanding more about COVID-19 and multiple sclerosis. So the format is she's going to speak about each for several minutes. Um, the first topic will be short and brief. Then we're going to open up the uh, for questions. And so for anybody who wants to ask questions, there's a box on your screen a little bit down on the right. It says questions and you just type in your questions to there, right? About whatever it might be concerning these topics or if you have anything else that you wanna ask the doctor, okay? So we will do the, she will do the presentation. And then after the presentation each time, we'll open it up to the Q&A. We'll do Q&A for about five to eight minutes. Then we'll stop the Q&A, she'll go on to the next topic. Do that for you know 10 to 12 minutes, all right, for the second one. All right, then we'll do more QA for a few minutes, and then we'll get to the last topic and she'll speak about that as well. All right, and then after that, we'll do another QA. So we'll have three sets of topics that Dr. Williams will discuss, and we'll have three different QAs going during this time as well. So that's all I really want to say. But you know, you're gonna see me pop in and out of the screen. It's basically when you see me come back on, it's well, it's almost time for Q&A again, all right? So I wanna begin, and first to begin, what am I gonna say? I'm gonna talk about Dr. Williams, and you know this, I do not know where I put your bio. How about that? Oh, there we go, after all this. Got too much of a mess in my desk, all right? It's a mess with a mess, right? So Ms. Joy Williams, a neurologist, serves as founder and CEO of the Joy Life Wellness Group, Multiple Sclerosis Center in Noonan, Georgia. In this position, she provides personalized multiple sclerosis care delivered with expertise, compassion, and joy. Dr. Williams is considered a, special, a subject matter expert in neurology and multiple sclerosis. And Joy Life Wellness is your final destination in a quest for comprehensive and compassionate multiple sclerosis care. And let's welcome Dr. Williams. Thank you so much, Stuart, for having me. I am very excited to be here and talk about some very exciting topics and hopefully answer some great questions. So um, thank you for having me on. And good evening, everyone. I bid you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia, where it's sunny but a little chilly. Um, I hope that everyone is doing well tonight, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about some updates with multiple sclerosis. One of the things that's uh, it, easy to lose sight of is that with so much information information going on about COVID-19, you know, there also is a lot of exciting information that's going on or exciting science that's going on in terms of just learning about multiple sclerosis in general. So I just want to talk about a couple of things um, that I think are really interesting and I think that will really make a difference in the coming year. So first off, we've had a medication approved um, for multiple sclerosis, Ozanamod. Um, it is a once a day pill that is in the same class as called an S1P inhibitor. So it's in the same class as two of our other medications that are currently on the market, Siponimod and um, Fingolimod. So it's in the same class of drugs. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about Ozanamod is that there are a couple of side effects that actually um, 
are, are, I won't say avoided, but are less prominent with this medication. So for those who are familiar with fingolimod, um, sometimes people have to do what we call or a first dose observation where they have to be monitored for six hours um, to look for any cardiac or heart issues. Um, that's not the case with ozanamod. Um, also, people don't have to have a mandatory eye exam. So some of the um, you know, increased work that's needed to get on some of our other medications is not there. There also is no gene testing, which is um, something that's prevalent with one of our other S1P inhibitors. Um, however, one of the concerns or side effects is that uh, there are some drug interactions. So um, there is an enzyme that basically kind of breaks down a lot of the drugs in our body or a lot of the chemicals in our body. And there are some possible interactions with um, some of the drugs that do that. And there are a lot of common drugs on the market, antidepressants, um, antibiotics um, that use this mechanism. So we'll be on the lookout to see kind of how that plays out in real time in terms of how people tolerate it. But that's certainly something to look out for. I believe they are launching June 1st. Um, so it's always great to have an additional therapy on the market to help treat uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, next up, there is another therapy that has applied for approval but has not received approval yet, and that's called ofatumumab. So ofatumumab is very interesting because it is a drug that targets the B cell. So interestingly enough, when we first started talking about MS therapy, we were very, very focused on T cells. Those are what I call the attack dogs that are kind of doing the attacking of the brain and spine related to MS. But in recent years, we've been focused more on the B cells, which I call the cheerleaders that signal the T cells to kind of attack and cause the demyelination and the lesions that we see related to MS. So we already have a B cell therapy on the market um, and Ofatumumab would be another what we call B cell therapy that would target those cells that encourage or signal your T cells to attack. And the interesting thing about this medication is that it will be an injection that's given once a month that can be done at home. So especially during a time like this, where we're concerned about social distancing, we're concerned about infusions and things of that nature, it will be very interesting to see um, how this addition to our MS armamentarium, so to speak, um, is used. But, you know, again, the more options we have, the better we can care for people living with MS. So I'm always excited when we have new therapies available um, for this potentially very disabling disease. So those are two of the other updates. And then there's one research study that I just briefly wanted to touch on that suggested that higher efficacy medications, so more effective medications for MS that are given early on, can actually delay disability. So this is a big subject of debate among those of us who treat MS. And the reason is because traditionally, we would start with what we would consider a milder medication or one that didn't have as many effects on the immune system. We would start with those kind of medications and then when people had problems, we would do what we call escalation of therapy. So if you had an issue, we go to something more effective. If you had an issue, we go to something more effective. But now many of us in the MS community are moving more toward what we call, it's not necessarily induction therapy like for cancer, but where you start a more effective drug early. And so there are several studies that are going on across the country with many of our academic centers, many of our MS centers, trying to help answer this question, which type of treatment is better, escalation, starting low and working our way up, or higher efficacy from the start. And there was a study, um, there were some preliminary results published from one of the studies that suggested that if we start higher efficacy therapy early, then that may delay disability. So again, you know, every treatment regimen, every treatment decision is very individualized. So there is no one size fits all with MS. There is no cookie cutter treatment for MS, but it is encouraging to help um, to that we are beginning to answer some of these questions that may help us to better inform the treatment decisions that we make um, with people living with MS. So um, that's all I have to say about updates right now. So I'll see if Stuart wants to come back on and see if we have any questions. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> that's great. So thank you for, for that first update. Um, the ozinamide, isn't the, um, the new pharmaceutical name though for this, isn't that Symposia? Ziposia, yes. So that is a trade name. The generic name is Ozanamod. Okay, got it. I wasn't sure. I wanted to be sure about that. And also, yes, that's um, correct. A person did write in and they wanted to know 
they don't know if they missed you saying or what and um, if um, how is that going to be provided? It's uh, meaning the route of administration, it's a pill. Yeah. It's a pill once a day. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a pill once a day, like the other medications in that class, the other S1, all of the S1P inhibitors are one pill once a day. Okay, great. And then a person wrote to me a little while ago and they asked about a medication that was just actually FDA approved two days ago, okay, called mm -hmm. Bafiertum, B-A-F-I-E-R-T-A-M. And it's by a no-name pharmaceutical company, but yet it got FDA approval. Do you any, do you know hey. anything about it? Um, what is the generic name of that one? Did they say what the generic name of that one was? No. Bafierta. Just B A F hey. as in Frank I E R T A M. Bafierta. Right. Hmm. So I've not heard of that one off the top of my head. Um, I do know that there is a generic form of fingolimod that is being approved. So I'm not sure if that is the trade name of it. So um, I tend to work a little bit more with the actual um, generic names of the drugs right, um, right. than the trade names, but I'm actually not sure. You know, okay. it's so actually it is so it's a very it's very similar to Tecfidera. Okay. So oh, is it? it is a generic form of Tecfidera. Okay, got it. So, you know, mm -hmm. with so much going on around us these days, it's very hard to keep up with the actual news. And I think Absolutely. that one just like slipped through the system there, you know? It did. It did. We all learned something, I think. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. We all learned something. Great. Okay, perfect. So, you know, I'm gonna we're gonna there's no more questions on this, and I'm just going to let you okay. now slide right into your next topic. And, you know, Bill, if you could put the topic on the screen, that would be great. And okay, I'm going to be off of here now. OK, thank you. Awesome sauce. All right. So this is a juicy one. So I'm excited to talk about this because there are a lot, a lot of advances. And I know that everyone is probably saturated with hearing about COVID-19. But I think the good news is that we are actually finding out more about how this may affect people with MS and also about treatments that may or may not be effective, which is Ultimately, you know, ultimately we want a cure, we want a type of vaccine that can prevent it from happening, but certainly some advances that can really be meaningful and help people who may be affected is also extremely important. So just a little bit about risk because, you know, I always want to address um, the risk for COVID-19 in people living with multiple sclerosis. Again, there are multiple countries, places across the globe that are, have started registries to help us better understand COVID-19 in multiple sclerosis. And so far, there still does not appear to be evidence that there is an increased risk of COVID-19 just by nature of you having MS. There are some studies that have been published that suggest that people with MS may get more infections, the most common being urinary tract infections. Um, and there's still a lot of questions about some of our disease modifying therapies, which can increase the risk for infection. But so far we haven't seen anything that suggests that just because you have MS, you are more likely to get um, or be infected with COVID-19 or with SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, virus. So the things that still seem to be the highest um, the, or the biggest players in risk are age. So age over 60, okay, um, some uh, uh, re, uh, surveys suggest over 65, but age over 60. Um, and then also if you have other comorbidities. So definitely if you have uncontrolled diabetes, if you have heart disease, if you have chronic lung disease like COPD. So there are some questions about asthma. Initially, everyone was saying severe asthma, um, but certainly if you have COPD, chronic obstructive lung disease, then that would definitely put you at increased risk. Um, so, you know, that's the information on the risk front. Um, the other things that I wanted to talk a little bit about are some of the treatments that we're learning more about. So there was a huge buzz about hydroxychloroquine in the beginning, you know, in March, you know, and in early April. And there have been several studies that have been published that suggest it really doesn't work that well to help um, COVID-19 infection. And in fact, some people may do more poorly because of heart issues, right? So there are some cardiac side effects of that. So hydroxychloroquine um, right now is not necessarily recommended for treatment of COVID-19. Again, there are some centers that are doing still conducting clinical trials because that is often the best way for us to find out information, but just kind of in the general public, it's not quite as popular as it was because there's 
that suggests it's not doing quite as well as we thought. But there is a big buzz about a drug called remdesivir. And so this is an antiviral drug. And there was a study that was recently published or the results were published this week. It was a very small study though, that suggested that it may improve outcomes with COVID-19 infection and that it actually may speed up um, the recovery time or decrease the recovery time. Um, and there was uh, in the study suggested that there, that people were able to, people who were hospitalized were able to leave, let's say at an average of 11 days versus 15 days. So seemed to decrease that time um, of sickness by an average of about four days, which is very encouraging. So the FDA has now allowed emergency use of this medication. I think one of the concerns moving forward is how is this distributed? Um, you know, there are some centers that are able to obtain it and there are some that are not. Um, so there are many of our scientists and experts who are trying to help um, help the rest of us understand, you know, how this is being distributed so that we can make sure that people receive appropriate treatment. So that is really exciting. Um, other things that I wanted to talk about are some of the information about MS treatments. So there actually was a very exciting um, letter that was published in one of our major neurology journals called The Lancet from the Italian group um, that has a large COVID-19 MS registry. So they have a total of about 600 patients in this registry who have COVID-19 and MS all across Italy. It is actually an international registry and about 500 of those patients are actually Italian. And then there are about 100 that are from other countries. So this is very exciting news because it's the largest amount um, of published data that we have. The data that they published was, or the letter that they published was about, was about maybe about 400 of those patients. And so they looked at 232 folks who had confirmed cases of COVID-19 infection, and they looked at about 175 that had suspected cases, meaning they had symptoms, et cetera. And what they found was that um, of the folks who were infected, of the 232 with confirmed infection, about 96% of them actually had mild symptoms or in some uh, had mild pneumonia or in some cases no pneumonia, which is very encouraging. So by and large, the majority of those people had very mild symptoms symptoms. And then there was about 3% that were critically ill and there were five people that died um, out of that total number of about five or 600. And I listened to a uh, podcast that occurred um, actually yesterday <laughs> about the subject from one of the authors who's over that registry. And they said that they've now had a total of six deaths out of about 600 people, um, which is a small percentage. So, you know, we are beginning to get some results and we are beginning to understand the disease process better. I think the other thing that was very interesting was at least from those data, it seemed like people on all different types of disease modifying therapies developed the infection. And there weren't necessarily a majority of people on one type of therapy that did more poorly. So this is one of the big questions for those of us treating for MS and for those of you who are taking medications for MS as well. You know, how do the disease modifying therapies affect outcomes? Most of our guidelines right now still suggest that we be cautious about uh, medications that deplete the cells or kill some of the immune cells. Um, but certainly the more data we have, the more we'll understand this. I think another interesting thing was that in that um, seminar that I listened to, they also talked about some data from one of our companies that produces ocrelizumab, um, which is one of our B cell um, depleting therapies. And they had a registry of about 100 folks um, who developed COVID-19. And there also did not appear to be more severe outcomes or a significant amount of severe outcomes. So um, all of that to say, I think that you know we are getting more and more information that's gonna help us inform treatment decisions. Again, remember MS is not a cookie cutter disease. So every treatment decision needs to be made individually with the person living with MS and their healthcare team but we are getting more information to help inform these decisions about what types of medications to start people on um, and how to do that safely. So I'm very excited to actually see some of this data coming to light. Oh, and then the other piece that I want to mention that's pretty amazing is that actually the group from Australia, so the Australia and New Zealand um, actually had published a combined amount of their results, and they've really done very good at flattening and almost getting rid of the curve. 
and they only had between those two countries five confirmed cases of COVID-19 and MS, which is amazing because they really almost had none. So New Zealand had one and then um, Australia had four and they each only had about a thousand people that were, inf that were infected. So, so, um, so they actually kind of crushing the curve, so. Okay, thank you for all that. That was a lot of information. So we do have a lot of questions, obviously. I bet, for this topic. I'm ready. I mean, I'm I, ready. I was, I, I was hoping you would hold off on that till last, okay? And no. we'll get to that yeah, but it, <laughs> yeah. it's okay. We'll get to that anyway. So one person just wrote, is there any way to find out if those of us in nursing homes can get tested for COVID-19? I'm in Rockland County, New York, and I've been sick three times so far this year. Mm -hmm. So that's that person's yeah, question. Yeah, so that's a, so that's a great question. You know, so treatment decisions are really up to the supervising physician about testing, you know, um, and of course, every state and even really every city in every state is a little bit different in terms of their availability of testing. So, for instance, here in Atlanta, initially everything had to be through you being seen. People had to have very severe symptoms. Um, then we moved to there actually being a drive through where you could get drive through testing. And now we move to where people can get antibody testing. So, you know, it definitely would not hurt to bring it up to the staff there to kind of see what their procedures are. But every place is going to be a little bit different in terms of their availability and access for testing. Sure. But that is an excellent question. And that was an excellent answer. There you go. <laughs> So next, uh, we have a, a person that is asking a question that I do not know if there is, you could even come up with an answer for this yet, but they wanna know if when a vaccine is developed, will there be the dead version for those with multiple sclerosis or will they have to take a live version? Yeah, so vaccine development, I am absolutely not an expert on vaccine development. You know, it really depends on the type of virus or the type of pathogen, you know, whether a live vaccine is more effective than a dead one. So there are some viruses like the flu where you actually have a live and a dead version, but most other uh, vaccinations are either one or the other. So it really depends on which one is the most effective when they do, um, when they get the results of the trials and if they are able to create an effective one that is both live and dead. You know, again, the general recommendation is that people do not receive live vaccines if they have MS. However, if there is a conversation with your healthcare provider and the benefits outweigh the risks, then in some cases we do um, proceed with live vaccines. So for my patients who are over 65, I do often recommend that they get the Pneumovax, which is a live vaccine because the benefits to that population would outweigh the risks. What is the general reason why an MS patient should not be getting a live vaccine? So it really is theoretical, right? So we don't have a lot of hard data that says that live vaccines actually cause worse outcomes. But the concern is if you get a live vaccine, would you potentially be more likely to develop a, some type of infection or some type of symptoms, which could temporarily worsen your MS symptoms? Or if you develop a severe infection, it could actually put you into a relapse. So that's the main concern, but again, each person is individual. We don't recommend that people just kind of do it willy nilly, but if you sit down with your doctor and the live vaccine is the best option, then in some cases we do um, recommend that for some of our patients. Great, thank you for that. Next one, heard a doctor say that vitamin D can help prevent virus from progressing into pneumonia. Is that true? I have not seen any data to that um, to that end. So I've not seen anything that suggests that vitamin D supplementation would um, keep coronavirus from, from progressing. Okay, next person says, I'm on a Baggio and I've heard and read that this drug is safer and not lowering the immune system. Right, so number one, we can't give specific medical advice, right, about people's specific therapy, however, Kind of in general terms, you know, there are some graphs that people have come up with with medications that they consider lower risk or higher risk. You know, in general terms, if there's a medication that actually you know, depletes the immune cells, like a, you know, some of our infusion therapies, then theoretically they can put people at higher risk for 
poor outcomes with infection. Some of our other medications that don't have the same effects would be potentially considered lower risk and Albagio may fit theoretically into that lower risk category. But again, we don't have a lot of data to really support that. So it's largely based on expert opinion at this point. And once we get more information from those registries, then we'll have some hard answers. Okay, thank you for that. Now, before I get to the next person's question, a lot of people mm -hmm. write to me constantly, mm -hmm. or I see them writing to others, telling the world that they, that they with MS, are immune comp. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about that? Because over all the years that I know MS, I know that we are, our immune systems are ramped up. Right, right. How does that make right. us immune compromised? So it doesn't, it doesn't, right? So at baseline with MS, I say that your immune system is not compromised. Your immune system is what I call doing the most, right? So it's doing the things that it's supposed to do, like fight infection, but it's also doing other things like attacking your myelin in your brain and in your spinal cord. Now, the immune compromise part comes in, and I put that in quotations, um, is because when people often start therapy for MS, right? So it's not the MS itself. The concern about being immunocompromised comes when you start taking a therapy because our therapies modulate, meaning they kind of tweak the immune system or they can suppress some of the cells. I think one of the things to keep in mind that's extremely important is that even though some of our medications do kill or deplete some of our immune cells, we don't deplete the cells to an extent like someone with cancer therapy would get, right? So if you think about a scale of immunosuppression, the drugs that we use for MS are on the lower end of that scale versus maybe some of the aggressive chemotherapies or things that people use for like stem cell transplant. So that is where kind of the thought about immune comprom um, com being immune compromised comes from. It's really from being on a disease modifying therapy, not necessarily just having MS. Okay, thank you for that. Next person. Mm -hmm. I'm prescribed IVIG five days every three months for SPMS. Does Gamunex C make me at a high risk for complications of COVID-19? T and B cells are low, low post Lemtrada five plus years. Um, so I've not seen any evidence um, about IVIG in terms of risk. IVIG um, has been used traditionally with multiple sclerosis, um, but um, it is not one of our FDA-approved therapies for MS. So I've not seen evidence that suggests that it causes someone to be immunocompromised or may lead to poor outcomes. But there's really not a lot of evidence. Most of our data is looking at our traditional um, you know, disease-modifying therapies, our injectables, our orals, and then our infusion therapies that are FDA-approved. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So going a little bit back to the, to the vaccine, yeah. Person, a person writes, once there's a vaccine for COVID-19, do you think there will be any restrictions for those on MS treatments to receive the vaccine? So that's a huge question, and, it, and it's an excellent question. I just was listening to some information about it um, this week. So the big question is that um, one of our concerns with some of our 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 therapies that deplete or kill some of the immune cells is that people may not be able to mount as good a response to vaccine. So for instance, with some of our infusion therapies, it's recommended not to take a vaccine within four to six weeks or a couple of months before you take that therapy. It's not because we're concerned that you'll get an infection, right, or that we're concerned you'll get a side effect from the uh, vaccine, the concern is that you won't develop a response because basically your immune system needs to be functioning properly for you to mount that immune response. And if you receive a vaccine while your immune cells are not, you know, at least close to their optimal function, then it just won't work um, and you won't be immune. So I think that's a big question that we're going to have to do some work to answer um, so that by the time a vaccine becomes available, we will know the best timing to give it to people so that they will be able to um, mount a proper immune response. Great, thank you for that. I think you might have mm -hmm. answered this when you were speaking earlier, but I'm not sure. And mm -hmm. uh, the person is asking, is there a database currently trying to find out how many people are living with multiple sclerosis that have contracted COVID-19? 
<clears throat> yes. So the short answer is yes. Um, there are a couple of different registries. So I actually saw one the other day for autoimmune disease, <clears throat> COVID-19 and autoimmune disease. And I think the name of the company was Leaky Joints or Creaky Joints or something like that that was sponsoring that. I'd never heard of that company. Um, but there is, um, there are several registries. So there actually has been quite a unification of the global community, um, the global scientific MS community in trying to help find answers. So as I said, the Italian registry has um, global partners. There is a global registry that is trying to develop data from people all over the world. There actually is a questionnaire that people living with MS can fill out through iConquer MS. If you're a member of iConquer MS, they actually have a COVID-19 survey to try to develop um, or understand information from a patient's perspective. Um, and then there is also a new registry that was formed by the Consortium of MS Centers, as well as the National MS Society. And that is a nationwide registry to understand COVID-19 and MS here in the US. So there are lots and lots of efforts to help get to the bottom of this. Right, and for those that are watching from outside the country or that might see this from outside the country, the msif.org also has registries running and places to take surveys. So mm -hmm. uh, you can, they can go there as well. Um, and, and also the, uh, that organization has surveys in different languages, whereas mm -hmm. nobody in the United States has that. So if they right. need to take it in Arabic or Spanish or French or German or whatever, it's all accessible through that website. So that's something mm -hmm. that, you know, for anybody that's watching from outside the United States, you have that option as well. Next Absolutely. question. And I would, okay. yeah, and I would encourage them also to look at their local um, multiple sclerosis societies because they, those efforts will be available um, for their local societies as well. That's probably true, yes. Um, what do you see as an emotional effects of COVID-19? Yeah, so I did a really interesting webinar um, the other night with some of my colleagues, one of whom is a psychiatrist, and we talked a lot about the emotional impact. Um, we talked a lot about anxiety, kind of around, you know, um, obviously fear of, you know, contracting the virus, but also, you know, being able to go out in public, you know, how are we to proceed ourselves? What is the future going to look like? So there's uh, definitely a lot of anxiety associated with that. Um, there also is some depression that can be associated with that. And I think we're seeing that across the board. I think it's important to recognize that some of those issues can be more prevalent um, or can happen more frequently in people with MS. So we need to make sure that if we're having those symptoms that we're reaching out to our healthcare team to make sure we address them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, is there any understanding of how someone living with multiple sclerosis could respond to COVID-19 differently than someone who does not live with any autoimmune disease? So I've not seen any studies that necessarily compare people with MS to other populations. Um, I know that there is a large registry conducted by the National Institutes of Health called the All of Us Registry. And they're doing some questionnaires around COVID-19. So because that would be such a broad registry across people all over the US, we certainly could see some comparisons Excuse me, but as I said, with the Italian registry and um, surprisingly a great source of information about COVID and MS is Twitter. So Twitter has got lots of great information. Um, you know, between those two, it seems that the majority of folks that have been reported, you know, from these registries and from individual physicians, the majority of folks with MS seem to have very mild symptoms like what we see with the general population. So, so far with the very small numbers of people that we have that have been reported, there doesn't seem to be, you know, just by nature of having MS to be a more severe outcome. But again, each person is a little bit different and we need larger numbers to better understand some of these results. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna go on to the next topic, okay? Sure. All right, a person just wrote, I am extremely nervous about getting exposed to COVID-19 when I go to my next infusion. Are there any tips that you can give me on social distancing during the infusions? Absolutely. So each, you know, each uh, infusion center is different, 
But most infusion centers are trying to um, enact policies to help with social distancing, people not sitting right next to each other, maybe spacing out chairs. It's also important to make sure that you wear a mask when you're out in public. You know, there's a lot of controversy going back and forth around gloves. Gloves sometimes can be helpful, but gloves sometimes can hurt a little bit more than they help because basically when you're wearing gloves and you're touching things, if you pick up the virus and you're kind of putting it on everything else that you touch. So just be careful about the gloves, but certainly masks are extremely important to help with social distancing. So, um, you know, I would check with that center and just ask what their policies are when you go for your next infusion and just make sure that you wear a mask. And Stuart is demonstrating for us with his very festive uh, MS orange and mask. hand sanitizer. Mask and sanitizer, and hand right? Sanitizer. And right. I want to I want to let you know when I go in somewhere and I, even if I have gloves on, even if I have uh, non latex gloves on, I still add this to the gloves and I smear it all over whatever I have to sit on, mm -hmm. you know, with the armrests or whatever. And then I take off mm -hmm. my gloves, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I just feel like it's I, I don't even want to touch it with my hands at all. So I just mm -hmm. do it that way with the gloves on. Right. And then I take Absolutely. off the gloves. But the, but the mask does stay on. All right. I have no Absolutely. problem taking the mask on. And what people don't know is they can't have their mask on and be touching their face the whole time That's with their right. hands. That's right. That's sort of right. Defeats the purpose, right? Absolutely. When you take that mask off, you need to go loop behind those ears and take it off that way. Don't touch your face. Absolutely. Great advice. Great. Thank you. All right. Let's go to the next topic. All right. All right. Okay. Last but not least. <laughs> you got it. Last but not least, and this one will be a little bit quick too, um, and we can answer some more of these great questions. As we'll talk a little bit about access to healthcare during the pandemic. So, you know, there are a lot of questions around how to receive care, what to do if you have issues. One of the great things about um, the pandemic, there, I mean, it's not a great thing, but one of the good or pluses that have, has come out of this is that there really has been an emergence of the use of telehealth and telemedicine. So these are things that have been used in many uh, disciplines of medicine for some time, but we're now able to use them more in the field of neurology. And it especially can be important for MS um, because people may live uh, long distances from their neurologist. You may have, um, you know, uh, forms of disability that may make it difficult for you to get out um, and get to those appointments. So telehealth is a great way to deal with that. So telehealth itself comprises a couple of different ways that you can communicate. So one of them is via telephone. So your doctor can call you and kind of do a visit over the telephone, um, you know, which can be very helpful. Um, and then there's also telemedicine, which includes, you know, those phone visits, but also will be a video vis visit. So for many of my patients, my office has been closed for the past couple months. Um, we'll log on to an application and they can see me just like you see me on the screen. And then I can see them, although I can't see all of you. So um, I can see them and they can see me. We can talk about, you know, the issues that they're having. You you know, in, in some cases we can do a limited exam. Obviously it's not as good as an in-person exam, um, but certainly we can um, have a very good office visit and be able to address issues and concerns that way. The telephone visits are also very helpful for some of my folks who are not as savvy with their smartphones, um, you know, who don't know how to use them as well. Um, so we can still um, get information to people that way. One of the challenges is that there are some people who don't have access to technology, um, you know, such as smartphones. There are also people who may not have access to the internet. And those video visits run best if you have, you know, a laptop or some type of computer where you can have access to the internet. They usually run much better or if your phone has access to the internet. So there are definitely some challenges there, but telemedicine really has a potential to reach a broad variety of people that we haven't been able to reach before. And for right now, um, the government has relaxed some of those very strict um, restrictions that have kept us from practicing telehealth. Um, I think the other piece that's important, um, if you could put my slide back up, Bill, I forgot the last point on my slide. In-person visits, okay, I thought of it just as, you, just as you put it back up. So in-person visits, I think the other thing that's gonna be extremely important 
is to talk about safety once you begin to do those in-person visits again with your doctors. So there are many doctor's offices that are opening up in the next couple of weeks here in Georgia. Um, things opened up a couple of weeks ago and my office will be opening back in June. So just making sure that we're continuing to practice social distancing, that we're continuing to wear our masks. If you have any questions, you can always call your doctor's office. Um, you know, and speak with someone about what measures they've put in place to make sure that you feel comfortable. And there are many places that will continue to do a combination of telehealth visits and in-person visits. So, you know, if you don't feel quite as comfortable coming in, you certainly can um, call and maybe request another telehealth visit and, until things get better. Um, so I think that we've got a long way to go with this, with this um, pandemic. Um, there's a lot that we're learning. There's a lot that we need to learn. But I think the most important thing uh, also to say is that if you're having problems, please don't be afraid to reach out to your healthcare team. So there's been a lot of concern that people are having symptoms, you know, like strokes and heart attacks at home and everyone's so terrified to go to the emergency room that they're having serious issues and not being addressed. So if you're having issues, please reach out to your healthcare provider. They will direct you to the correct place to go, whether it's to come into the office or what you need to do. But please, if you're having severe symptoms, don't stay at home and suffer because of fear of COVID-19. Make sure that you reach out to somebody and get some instructions in some direction. Yeah, thank you for that. So there are, mm -hmm. we hear about that constantly. I mean, I have even got family with, you know, the same issues. And, and even myself, I had a, you know, I have a problem yeah. with my leg and I said, there's no way I'm going to the emergency room. Uh, you know, right, it's, right, it's, right. who would want to at this stage of the game, right? So right. The, the next right. question is, uh, my neurologist's office is closed and I feel new symptoms. If I'm, if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm having a relapse, but would not want to go to the ER. What are people doing who cannot see their doctors? And you did just answer that with the telemedicine, but what if they mm -hmm. feel that they would like a neurologist to actually be seeing how they're walking? Is that covered mm -hmm. in telemedicine? Um, you, mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, some people just think that they need a more hands-on approach, and I think they just need mm -hmm. a surety with the telemedicine. Is there anything you could say about that? Yeah. So, you know, again, there are many offices that are starting to open up. However, there is an exam that you can do via telemedicine. So telemedicine for stroke has been going on for years, right? So there are some things that we can do very easily on exam, you know, depending on how creative your neurologist is, you know, I have people prop their phone up against something. So I could see them walk and do things like that. Um, so there's a lot that we can do via telemedicine. If it is a doctor that knows you and kind of knows your baseline, it is often a little bit better to have them assess you in some form because they know what you look like at baseline. Nine times out of 10, if you go to the ER, depending on how severe it is, you still may not see a neurologist. A neurologist is not necessarily there in the ER, um, especially depending on what time you go to see some of those consults. So there's not really a guarantee that you will see a neurologist and also that person kind of won't know what your baseline is. If in doubt, always call your doctor, talk to them. Many of my colleagues are prescribing steroids, um, you know, via um, telemedicine after a telemedicine visit if they feel like that is needed. So, you know, just make sure you reach out to your regular doctor and then, you know, kind of see what instructions they have from there. Uh oh, I lost you, Stuart. I can't hear you. You're right. That's because I put it on mute. <laughs> <laughs> a person wrote, if I'm scheduled for my routine six-month visit with my neuro, should I consider telemed? Yeah, so always call them, right? So, for instance, my mother has diabetes, and so, you know, she's supposed to go for certain blood checks. And what we did was we just called her doctor's office and said, hey, you know, she's, you know, I won't call my mom old, she's mature, you know, so, she, you know, she's of a certain age, she may be at higher risk, does she absolutely have to come in for that? And so, you know, often they were able to work with us and reschedule some of those appointments, you know, because they weren't essential or change them to telemedicine appointments. So always call and ask. And if they feel like you need to come in, you know, especially if you're having new symptoms, they'll say come in, but oftentimes they may be able to see you remotely. Great, thank you for that answer. Next one, mm -hmm. since COVID, 
I've had to change my infusion center and work with my insurance for coordination of all of this, which has been extremely stressful. Can you tell me what could happen if I miss an infusion? So each infusion is different. So, I mean, I, I don't know what type of infusion that person is on, um, but again, oftentimes, some of our medicines, even though they're given at certain intervals, can last longer than that general interval they're given for. So for instance, with a medication like ocrelizumab, it's given once every six months. However, there are some studies that suggest it can last, the effects can last much longer than that. Same with some of our other medications like natalizumab, even though it's given every 28 days, um, there are some folks who are now doing extended interval dosing where we do it every six to eight weeks. So you know, each person is individual, each person's effects are individual. Some people feel like the medicine wears off and they begin having symptoms. So there's just a lot of different things that kind of go into, you know, how soon a person does or does not need an infusion. Um, again, if you miss an infusion, depending on how long, you know, until your next one, you know, it often is not the end of the world. Don't tell anybody I said that. But if you're getting close to it and something you know, happens where you're not able to do it, make sure that you check in with your healthcare provider immediately to see when that can be scheduled. So you know, the medicines work if you take them like you're supposed to, but in some cases there are things that happen that we can't prevent that make people miss an infusion. And oftentimes they're able to do it a little bit later with their doctor's guidance. Perfect, thank you for that. Next one, I've seen online that there are certain vitamins that we can take to help boost the immune system against COVID. Is there anything that is recommended or I'm going to add to it, should they not be boosting their immune system? Yeah, so I'm not a boosting fan, right? So remember your immune system is doing the most, okay? So we don't want it to do any more extra than it's doing, you know? And of course you have to be a little bit careful about some of the claims on vitamins that necessarily boost the immune system. You know, uh, in terms of vitamins to keep your immune system healthy, Certainly a multivitamin is extremely important. Vitamin D does help with some immune function, um, which is why we do, uh, we have seen some studies that suggest that low vitamin D can affect the course of MS. Also vitamin B12 is very important because if vitamin B12 is low, then it can cause some neurologic symptoms that are similar to MS. So I generally recommend that most of my patients take um, a multivitamin and then if their vitamin D and B are low to take supplements of that. And that's something that your doctor or can give you some direction on. Great, thank you. Next one, my doctor's appointment have either all been canceled or rescheduled to virtual telehealth. I'm concerned that my insurance though will not cover telehealth visit. How do I find out if this is covered and so that I don't get hit with bills later? Yeah, great question. So during the majority of the, so during the pandemic, um, government insurance, so CM which controls Medicare and Medicaid, as well as most of the private insurers are covering telehealth visits. Um, the regulations are a little bit different on a state-by-state -state basis, but generally, if your physician is doing telehealth, they're generally not going to do it unless they can get reimbursed for it by your insurance company, um, unless there's some out-of-pocket, you know, unless there's some um, you know, fee for service payment where you pay up front. So, you know, you, if your doctor is doing telehealth, then your insurance is likely covering it because the office would not do that visit if they weren't going to get, get reimbursed for it. If a person lives out of state, of your mm -hmm. state, can mm -hmm. they contact you? And are you able to give them medical advice if they're living, say, in New Mexico and you're in Georgia? Mm -hmm. Great question. So for right now, the answer to that is yes. So previously, before the pandemic, in order to see someone who lived out of state, you had to have a license in the state where that person lives. So the, the place of service is where the patient lives. However, because of the need for social distancing, especially in some populations that may be more vulnerable, many of those regulations have been relaxed. So physicians can see people across 
state lines. Certainly there are some restrictions for some states, but most states you're able to see people across state lines and they can contact me or another uh, event specialist and be seen. You know, uh, there are doctors who are doing so. For instance, I do chart reviews where I kind of review people's chart. I also do educational consults, you know, but you have to kind of determine if you're establishing care with that person or if you just, you know, want them to review your chart and kind of give you some advice and you go back to your regular physician. So it's important to kind of establish that up front. Great. That's an awesome answer. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, next. Sorry about that. That's it's okay. Not a, it's not a cold. It's called talking too I was much. About to... Right, right. I'm <laughs> yeah. getting a little cotton mouth myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I have uh, lozenges here, but that would only make it difficult to speak. All right. So exactly. next, uh, what tips do you offer for people who are feeling extremely isolated and anxious during this time? I want to stay informed, but watching the news is extremely nerve wracking. And this person is asking this question, but I've actually heard from two people this week who have become suicidal from it, and they've already seen who needed to be seen. But what can you what can you discuss going forward with this as well? Take a break, right? Um, you know, social media can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. Technology can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. You know, so if you begin to feel yourself getting overwhelmed, it's okay to take breaks. You don't have to be up on every single thing that happens every minute. And that's one of the uh, challenges when you're at home, you know, is that you're like, oh my gosh, I need to know what's going on. Or someone might call and say this happened or this happened. So, you know, you might even want to set time limits for yourself. Say, okay, I'm not going to spend more than this amount of time per day watching the news. I'm not going to spend more than this amount of time per day on social media. And now they have even, you know, charts in your phone that tell you how long you've been on there. The other thing that I would encourage people to do is that even though we're socially distancing, you don't have to be emotionally distanced. So many support groups are still conducting activities, talking about positive things, um, or webinars such as this where you can get valid information and Stuart and I hopefully are not depressing. I think we're pretty fun if you ask me. Um, you can get good information. Also look at it as an opportunity to connect with people that you may have not connected with. So I've got good friends Friends. We've hopped on some conference calls, people I haven't talked to in months. I've been able to catch up with some of them. So look at it as an opportunity to uh, reconnect with some folks that maybe you lost track of, um, whether it's via webinars or via support groups, and also find some positive things to do with your time. So we've been doing coloring in my house. I've got a three and a six-year-old, um, and we've been doing some, some knitting. So, you know, take an opportunity to pick up some of those old hobbies as well. And you can FaceTime or whatever. And you can FaceTime. Yeah, so we FaceTime with my mom. I have a 93-year-old grandmother. Um, and so my kids FaceTime with her. And, you know, we're able to enjoy connecting with people, even though we can't physically see them or touch them like we would like to. Great. Thank you for that. This last mm -hmm. question, it has mm -hmm. nothing to do with COVID. But a person, okay. wants, to know, a person wants to know if they take is it possible for them to take too much vitamin D? I'm currently taking 10,000 IUs a day and wanted to do a multivitamin, which also contains vitamin D. And when is it too much? So your doctor can do a blessing to tell you if it's too much. So, you know, I, I have on a rare occasion done a vitamin D test where someone had over the normal limit, um, but it's been very rare, you know. So, you know, always consult your doctor before adding extra vitamins to know, you know, if that's too much, if you need to back down on one dose, and they can do a blood test when they do your blood work, and that will tell you if the level is too high or if it's still within normal range. Great. Thank you for all these answers to all these questions. And I just want to add something. You know, a lot of you are home right now and you might normally be home, but maybe you just get out to the stores or you go to work, you go shopping or whatever. You know, last year I was on the road 148 nights doing educational I programs across, across the United States. All right. And you want to talk about cabin fever. It's way beyond cabin fever. I need to get up in the air again. I need to get on a plane. I mean, that's it's destroying me. I need to get yeah. in the air. I need to fly somewhere. I don't care where. Yeah. And I don't care if it yeah. means just flying to Atlanta, hopping on another plane and coming back. But I might be doing that real soon because yeah. I'm just, I got to get up. I got to get in the air. All right. Um, yeah. But 
you know, everybody, everybody is dealing with this matter in their own way and having their own issues with it. And whether they have multiple sclerosis or not, there are problems to be had for everybody. And everybody's got the same questions and wonders and whatnot and conspiracy theory or not conspiracy theory. But, you know, as far as your own health is concerned, like Dr. Williams is saying, you really, really got to rely on your healthcare team. So, absolutely. So, you know, um, we do hope, I do thank everybody that was on this call tonight. I do thank Dr. Williams very, very much. Thank I know we can't you. hear everybody. I know we can't hear everybody clapping, but you could see me doing it, all right? <laughs> and, and, um, and, I, and I look forward to when we have you again on here. And, you know, it's not just that we're doing this only for COVID-19, but going forward, we're going to keep on doing these virtual programs. So we do look forward to seeing you again. Oh, and yes, you can see the screen right now. You have all those different ways of seeing Dr. Williams. And by the way, this is going to be video recorded. It is recorded Absolutely. and it's going to be on our YouTube channel in probably within 24 hours. So um, thank awesome. you again, everybody, for being here. And thank you again, Dr. Williams. Thank no round all. of applause from everybody, but thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure. Perfect. Thank you. Have a good night.